first of all, if I can uh, just welcome colleagues to uh, this session. Uh, I think it's the, the first time that we've had uh, a discussion on the international trade outlook um, as part of uh, this annual conference of uh, AIST. So I think from my perspective that's a good thing. Just very quickly, if I can introduce myself, I'm moderating the session this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Vale. Uh, some of you may or may not have known I was a, uh, the Trade Minister for almost eight years in the, uh, in the Howard Government at the time when we were sort of making some significant progress in the multilateral system through the WTO as well as uh, really beginning the, the uh, embarkation on uh, our bilateral trade policy agenda. Uh, since uh, departing uh, from my political career, uh, I now work in the private sector on a number of uh, boards of Australian listed companies um, and uh, also, as you, most of you would know, I'm a trustee director of Host Plus uh, Superannuation Fund and, and that's um, been of great fascination to me as we've watched over the, uh, the last six or seven years the, the phenomenal growth uh, in the, the size of uh, Australian industry superannuation funds and the debates that have been taking place around the regulation uh, of those. But this morning's about a very, very uh, fascinating and incredibly important subject for the Australian economy and for Australian investors, both within that context in the Australian economy and externally uh, out of Australia. Um, the, uh, we've got an expert panel that uh, we're all going to make a contribution in a minute, if I can introduce them. From my uh, uh, left, firstly, uh, uh, Cassandra Winsen-Reed, the Chief Economist from EFIC. EFIC's the Export Finance and In Insurance Corporation. It's a, a, a government instrumentality that supports Australian exporters. We've got uh, Karthik Iyer, who's the Commercial Advisor, Financial Services Organisation, Department of International Trade in the UK, and you, you would immediately say, oh, they've got a Department of International Trade in the UK. Yes, they are developing one post the Brexit vote in anticipation of the final disconnection with the EU. So it'll be fascinating to hear from, uh, from Karthik with regard to what's happening in the UK, because almost for 40 years they've not had to have a trade policy per se or engage bilaterally with the rest of the world because it's all been done through Brussels. And, uh, and our third panellist, uh, uh, Gary Huffbayer, who's the Reginald Jones Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in the United States. Uh, obviously, it will be fascinating, uh, Gary, to, to hear your views about um, the current administration's uh, departure from recent conventional connection for the United States as far as a leader in uh, global trade liberalisation uh, and, and, uh, and globalisation. And so, colleagues, it's going to be uh, a very interesting discussion. Very quickly, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, at each one of these sessions, I think there's been a question asked uh, that you all need to answer, if you can, electronically. And the question is, is trade a factor when considering future investment decisions for your fund. So yeah, it's fairly simple. There's multiple choice answers, yes, no, occasionally. So if you could um, attend to that, and we'll watch to see how that comes up on the screen. Just very quickly before I go to our panellists, uh, who are going to just give a quick um, five or, or so minute overview of their, their view on the current uh, global trading circumstances and the outlook. Um, I was just going to give you some, some interesting uh, data points uh, on Australia. Now, Australia's, uh, and these are straight off the DFAT fact sheet, uh, Australia's uh, GDP currently stands at about uh, $1.359 trillion, um, which has seen phenomenal growth over the last 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I think it was five or six hundred billion dollars with the GDP in Australia. So that growth has taken place in a couple of decades and, and in my view, has been largely driven uh, by the outward focus and looking at uh, engaging internationally uh, in trade and investment flows. Two-way trade, about $673 billion. Uh, we're currently in, in FY17 experienced growth of 3.1 per cent in our economy, which was quite significant amongst the G20 countries. Um, interesting and one of the, you know, the very, very important data points in this, this set of statistics uh, for our industry, if you like, is the, 
the investment flows, both inbound FDI and outbound FDI, and it's interesting, they don't quite balance, but they're quite significant. So inbound FDI into Australia is $3.19 trillion, a billion dollars, so, or no, trillion, 3,192 billion, 3.19 trillion Australian dollars. Outbound FDI out of Australia into markets across the world is $2.17 trillion. Um, interesting statistics and one that comes to mind is that Australia is the sixth largest investor in the United States of America, for example. Um, and you know, you, you give that statistic to American interlocutors and they, they're quite surprised, but uh, Australia is, is very, uh, a very large outbound FDI investor, but as you can see, we also attract a lot of inbound FDI and we've needed that to provide capital for the growth that has taken place uh, in our economy. So with that, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read these out just yet, but there's uh, uh, the statistics have come up on, on uh, the question. Uh, yes is 35%, no is 31%, and occasionally is 34%. So hopefully after today, um, that, that, uh, that yes vote, uh, today's discussion, that yes vote might increase a little bit. So I'm now going to, to go to the panel and I'll start immediately with, on my left with Cassandra. Thank you. Uh, so look, as Mark mentioned, uh, I work for EFIC. So EFIC is Australia's export credit agency. That means we provide finance to uh, Australian exporters, uh, all their buyers, where the private market deems it too risky. So our mandate is basically to uh, put Australian exporters on as positive a footing as possible. Um, and so I thought I'd just speak speak very quickly about the Australian export outlook. Um, so, so actually we're pretty optimistic. Um, we are expecting strong sustained growth in Australia's exports over the next couple of years. Now that broadly owes to the global economic and trade recovery that we've seen. Also our very strong uh, links to Asian partners. But I think it's important to note that our export outlook is very two speed. So on the one hand you've got resources. Look we do expect the prices of Australia's largest commodity exports to decline over uh, the coming years, but at its height, um, in the mining boom, mining investment was about 9% of GDP. And all of that mining investment is now giving way to mining exports. So in volume terms, we're very, very strong as all that new capacity comes online. So we've got a subdued commodity price outlook, uh, but all that volume means that in value terms, Australia's resources exports expected to remain about stable over the next couple of years. But yes, okay, the, the resources are going to form the, the mainstay, um, but they're certainly not going to drive the growth uh, that we've seen uh, in Australia's export profile over the past decade. And of course, that owes to China's economic rebalancing. As we all know, China now driven less by heavy industry, driven more by consumption and by services. Already home to the world's largest middle class population, uh, but McKinsey estimates that between 2015 and 2030, uh, the number of middle class consumers consumers in China will grow by an extra 100 million people, their consumer spending will more than double. So China's Economic Rebalancing Act very much causing Australia's export profile to rebalance, albeit in the margins, but from resources uh, to non-resources. In particular, uh, services are hitting new record highs. Education is now Australia's third largest export. It grew 20% last financial year. Tourism absolutely booming. We had eight and a half million arrivals uh, last year. And despite China's economic slowdown, China accounted for about 1.3 billion of them. Um, so those Chinese uh, visitors spent 11 billion. Tourism Australia reckons we can do better. They think the market could be worth 20 billion uh, in five years. And it's not too hard to believe Tourism Australia, given the fact that only 5% of the population currently own a passport. Uh, so agriculture is another um, area where we see continued long-term potential as Asian diets and their incomes improve. We think that capacity constraints, resource constraints, will probably curtail Australia's ability to become the food bowl of Asia, but we see that there's perhaps a competitive position as, as the, the delicatessen of Asia, if you like. Uh, so already Australian companies willing, uh, winning niche, niche sales in really quality markets, and they're really trading on the, the clean and green image that is the Made in Australia logo. Uh, so Australian exports of beef, for instance, up tenfold over the five years to 2016. Exports of dairy have tripled over the same period. And we think that there is 
uh, scope to do more. Uh, so the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement now in place that will abolish tariffs of about 20% on Australia's dairy import export sorry, uh, over 11 years. So certainly the global macro economy is supportive of Australia's continued uh, export performance. There's always headwinds. Uh, probably be remiss of me not to mention a couple of those. Uh, so the strong Aussie dollar, of course. Um, since their peak in 2011, commodity prices are down by about half. The Aussie dollar is about by 30% over the same period. Uh, but this year, the Aussie's been pretty uncooperative. It's actually up 10%. Of course, that's bad for export competitiveness. Um, the RBA doing some work saying that a 10% depreciation, our exchange rate actually boosts export volumes by about 4%. Uh, headwind number two, China's economic slowdown. Uh, China actually accelerated in the first half of the year. It, it, it went above target at 6.9%, but the risk of debt of overcapacity, that's looming large, and we think that the slowdown will resume once uh, Chinese policymakers turn their attention to those uh, headwinds. Uh, mentionable headwind number three, increasing protectionism. I think governments around the world are getting really uh, frustrated with the slow pace of economic recovery, and they've They've implemented a slew of protectionist measures. Uh, so Global Trade Alert now says that 62% of Australia's exports are subject to discriminatory measures in host countries, and that was up from just about 23% in 2009. So that we're not absolutely not saying that there are, the export isn't without challenges, but our SME community is telling us that they're actually pretty optimistic. So we did a, a survey in July of 1,200 SME exporters. 58% uh, of them said they expect their international profitability to improve over the next financial year. That corresponds with a DHL survey saying that exporter confidence uh, is at uh, the highest level since 2011. So certainly uh, not without its challenges challenges, but, but the exporter community seems to agree with us, the, the macroeconomists, which, ha which happens very rarely, uh, that the outlook is fairly bright. Great. Thanks, uh, Cassandra. Just before going to, uh, to Gary, um, I need to alert you to the fact that the AXA Investment Managers Live Q&A is now open and will be for the duration of the session, so uh, send your questions via the, uh, the ASI app. And just for my benefit, if you don't mind uh, just putting your name to your question, so as they scroll up, I can get you to, uh, from the floor, ask your question to whichever panellist you want to direct that question, uh, please. Okay, over to, to Gary. Well, thanks very much, and it's great to be here. Uh, you can't see it over my head, but there's a cloud. This is a very optimistic meeting. I've enjoyed it, and Cassandra has given you a very optimistic outlook on on uh, the Australian trade picture, and I'm now going to balance that with a huge dose of pessimism. So <laughs> just picture this cloud over here. But of course, I come from Washington, and you know what that means. Well, <laughs> uh, first of all, some statistics. Uh, very, very few, but we have not had global trade growth at the customary rate for the last decade. The customary rate is between the early 50s and uh, 2007, when global trade grew by 2% to 4% faster than world GDP and was a real driver of world GDP. That era stopped a decade ago. <clears throat> also, foreign direct investment, which is quite closely tied to trade, uh, has not resumed the level that it reached in 2007, which was about $2 trillion. It's been hovering in the kind of $1.5 trillion level. These are not good statistics on a global basis. So maybe, you know, Australia is a nice kind of bubble of happiness in this world, which doesn't look so, so great from the statistical standpoint. Now, why did world trade grow uh, so fast for almost for 60 years? Two reasons. One, technology, containers, uh, better ports, all that, uh, digital. The second was policy liberalization, global policy liberalization for almost 60 years. We still have technology going forward, particularly in the Asia area. Policy liberalization stopped. It stopped in 2000. Uh, 
you know, we had the Doha round, but the Doha round has not gone any place. And we've had some small deals with, on a bilateral basis, U.S., Korea, we had uh, Europe, Canada. These are important deals for sure, but they're not global earth-shaking deals. So half of the reason, we've done the econometrics on this, for trade to grow faster and be a driver of the world economy has disappeared. Now, let's come to the politics. Uh, the, <clears throat> the U.S. is irrelevant for the world trading system now. It's going to be irrelevant during the Trump administration. And the only question is whether the irrelevance is benevolent or male malevolent. So the, bene the benevolent irrelevance will be that Trump puts out his tweets and he's going to terminate Korea, U.S. one day and NAFTA the next, and then he's not going to do it the following day and going to have a trade war with China one day and, you know, denounce him as a currency manipulator, and then we're not going to do that. So that's, you know, he, he's been back and forth, uh, but he has not taken much action. In fact, very little action. The action we have to restrain trade is the customary anti-dumping, countervailing duty, and now some safeguard cases. And they are going up, but they, that covers about 8% of U.S. trade. If that's the pace for the next um, four years, or you know, the re remainder of his term, and maybe a second term, you know, I would call that a benevolent irrelevance. The malevolent is he actually does what he talked about doing in the campaign. And that will be a shock even to optimistic Australia if that, if that happens. And he has the power. Be, make no mistake, he has the statutory power delegated from Congress to do all the things he talked about in the campaign, the 45% tariff on China and on and on. The courts won't stop him. The, what will stop him and what is holding him back is the Congress and the business community. And we're beginning to get the backlash. And so that may very well just keep him in this political space of blaming all the problems of his base on, you know, globalization, trade, and so forth, uh, but not actually doing anything. That, uh, but if he starts doing things, and if we have a recession, the chance of his doing things is greater. That's not going to be good. That will be very bad. So... Since irrelevance is the major theme, who's going to take on trade leadership or global economic, international economic leadership? Well, China, it's for China to lose. China can do it. It has very able leaders. But in order to do it, they not only have to give the talk in, 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 at uh, Davos, they have to do the walk. And what does the walk mean? It means less of this digital protectionism, more openness to investment, uh, fewer restrictions on trade of all kinds. They have a lot of barriers. So if they do that, yes, they can be the global leader for the next 20 years. <clears throat> but that will mean a lot of internal changes. The second possible leader is, of course, the European Union, which has all the problems which Stephen told us about on the first day, and, and everyone is, I think, pretty aware of them. If they can overcome their internal problems within the EU, conceivably they could take a leadership of the world trading system. If we don't have China or the EU, what we have is the absence of a hegemonic leadership in the world economy. We have not had that absence in anybody's lifetime in this room. And if you, ha if you don't have a leader, well, maybe the system goes on okay, you know, but maybe it's not something we, we know. And I'm very skeptical that the system, either in the economic or the political, realm will do well with the absence of a hegemonic leader. But let me leave with a slightly optimistic note, having put you all in a state of depression. Uh, you know, the UK, and I'm really tossing this to my colleague, the UK could punch above its weight if it actually adopted the policies which Patrick Minford has advocated, unilateral free trade, unilateral free trade. That would be dramatic. Over to you. Thank you for that. <laughs> with, with that, we'll uh, that hospital pass straight to Kathy. It's over to you. Cool. Thank, thank you, Mark, and thanks for all the comments from the others to set the tone. Um, so I work in the Department for International Trade at the UK, as, as Mark said, which is uh, just over a year old now, 
uh, post the referendum. Uh, so broadly, uh, the day job uh, of the team, uh, of the whole department, is three parts. One is trade promotion, um, and then export finance as well. Uh, but the new part, which has been uh, come into play from last year, is the trade policy side. Um, so as you know, for almost four decades, uh, all the trade negotiations was done through the EU in Brussels. So that will all move in-house now. And literally in the last year, in 12 months alone, uh, that team has gone from zero to about 240-odd people. Uh, and in fact, we have um, somebody from New Zealand and from this part of the world to head up the, um, the trade negotiations, um, Lawrence Faulkner, uh, and the other you know, slew of professionals and people from all over the world. Um, for me personally as well, it's great to be back here. Um, so I spend most of my early uh, part of my working life in Australia. So technically, I'm an export. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I still have my Australian passport. So I work very closely with the financial services team. Um, and I guess for today's uh, audience, uh, in terms of actual impact of trade, which I'm really looking forward to hearing your views as well and questions, is, is the part where I, I work as a commercial advisor and talking to financial institutions globally, uh, and then looking at how I can then play that back to policymakers uh, in terms of making sure that that adds to and enhances trade. Uh, and what that means is that uh, talking to many of uh, the pension funds here, um, I was with many of the, the top eight pension funds in Brazil uh, last week, uh, talking to asset managers globally, uh, both in terms of foreign direct investment into the UK, in our case, but equally how we can open new markets for the UK, which is pretty much uh, the remit of our department, which is outward looking, forward looking, how do we create those new uh, positive act aspects and uh, the challenge you've posed in terms of taking the lead. Yeah. Uh, in terms of your original question of uh, outlook, uh, obviously, there's a lot happening uh, in, in terms of the, the trade area in the UK, as you can imagine now, not just with Europe, but in terms of globally as well, because we are at the juncture where we're looking at what we're doing now with Europe um, versus what we'll be doing outside of Europe as well. So that automatically forces us to look at what are the future areas of opportunity and growth, uh, because we have to start from scratch. So we need to look at potential areas for both imports and exports. So one useful stat for us is that the current um, top list of exports, so Australia is number 13 on that for us in the UK, if I include EU as the number one, which is the number one. If I break it down into the number of countries, Australia is number six. So that gives you an idea of how this unpicking and the realignment of what we look at in terms of trade and trading regions might potentially change. So any kind of bilateral dialogue we have of the, the, the new world uh, will define how that changes over the next period of time. Definitely agree with you on China. Uh, and again, I think it's not just about, I think it's very easy to look at trade as a bipolar one-to-one -one country. Uh, the general trends are there lots moving towards the east, uh, but also intra-countries is the big thing. So if China's building the, the Silk Road and the old Belt and Road Initiative, as they call it, which is going all the way through Kazakhstan, Pakistan, and then to Eastern Europe, the amount of work that's going to create and the trade we're looking at as opportunities in that area for UK exports uh, is dramatic. So it's not just about UK-China, it's about what China is doing and in that value chain where we're going to uh, make, make our um, you know, success stories. Uh, and then linking back to you, I think, uh, for, for the, the investment teams, the big thing is, obviously this is all very macro, as we said, in terms of trade as a whole. But any of those when you bring it down from the country level to the sector level and uh, industry level, which is what I do, so okay, that's trade within that financial service, I look at asset management, then it's understanding which companies gain from those opportunities uh, and how do they behave and how do we uh, pave the way for those, those companies. And for, for you, I guess it'll be more about, in the short term, tactical asset allocation, but in the long term, what is the strategic asset allocation and how do you then pick those companies or assets uh, and in which countries in this moving sort of trajectory. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Karthik. Now, we've started to get a few questions come up on the screen, but I'm going to ask the first one uh, to Gary. And just, you know, given the impact of the shift in disposition from in the United States, who have traditionally been the leaders in this field. I mean, you know, if, if I remember the, you know, launching the Doha round, it was driven by the United States and the European Union. Uh, and without that energy going into it, it, it wouldn't have happened. And, and ultimately, um, uh, you know, the unilateral liberalisation, the, the closest that I think you're probably going to get to that yeah. is through the multilateral system. Yeah. 
And, and so, uh, absent the US, and, and um, it seems that uh, not just President Trump, but also um, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross are taking a sort of a, a transactional approach to different elements, whether it's NAFTA, whether it's the, the, the trade balance with China, um, and, and you know they just believe in a you know in a, in a zero sum game approach. If if they're not making a dollar out of it, if they're not involved, they're not ahead on every deal, then it's not worth doing. They don't sort of look at the fact that you know America might have a um, a trade deficit with China, but a trade surplus with Australia, and we've got a trade surplus with China, and and, and the swings and roundabouts in the system. Um, you don't think that that is ever going to get sort of breached. You don't think that there, there's going to be um, a sort of a uh, uh, an epiphany along the way that, that all of a sudden they're going to realise, well, hang on a minute, this is just because we do this in the real estate game in New York, it doesn't work in global trade. <laughs> well, we can all hope for an epiphany, <laughs> but I'd say the chances are close to 1%, if that high. Uh, President Trump is a mercantilist for sure. Exports good, imports bad. But he's also a physiocrat, even though his own business is services. He's always talking only about goods. Autos are a particular one dear to his heart. So here's a president who thinks that an export surplus in goods uh, with, a, with any partner is a sign that, you know, it was a good deal. It was a good arrangement. So yes, our trade with Australia is great. We have an export surplus in goods. Mm. But with Mexico, with, with China, with a great many countries in the world, you know, we've been taken to the cleaners. I mean, and there's this very, this view, which, which I actually think he believes, which is unfortunate, uh, it's not just a political sales job, that, you know, that's the measure of, an, of success in trade. So he's not about to change. He's held these views since 1980. That's a long time. Um, and uh, we, we've gone back and looked at the statements he made back then and so on. So, Wilbur Ross is a very smart guy, and whether he believes all this stuff or not, I don't know, but the boss is Trump. Mm -hmm. And Lighthizer, uh, the ambassador, ambassador Lighthizer, whom I know, uh, is a very, he's a brilliant lawyer, no doubt about it, but he is, he's been on the protectionist side of the trade remedy game for, for 30 years as a, as a lawyer in Washington. That's probably why he's been appointed USTR. Pardon? That's why the administration has pointed, appointed him as USTR. Yes, right, right. He earned, yeah. he earned it. He earned, mm. he earned it. So the epiphany is, I think, uh, unfortunately not very likely. Um, and for the World Trade Organization, I'm with you on everything you said, Mark, on that. But, you know, their attitude is, is wait and see. That's their, their, that's, their, that's their attitude. So the chances of getting a revival of U.S. leadership in the WTO seems, you know, remote. Yeah. Thanks, Sir. Okay, I'm going to go to questions now from the audience that I've got queued here. Have we got a raving microphone anywhere? Nice. Yep. Because the first one's from Sam Cecilia, and I'm going to get Sam to get on his scrapers and ask the question himself. Uh, we all, I don't, Sam needs no introduction, he's over here on the, on the left. Stand up, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did this because I knew he'd ask a question. <laughs> uh, my question's disappeared, sorry Mark. Um, oh, I'll try to go by memory. Uh, m most people believe that technology I'm sorry, most people believe that globalisation and therefore globalisation of trade has been the root, at the root cause of job losses. But the truth is technology has impacted job losses more. How do you see technology and the rapid rate of arrival of technology impacting trade in future? Can I just perhaps provide an example? There was a time when we would have to send surgeons into, into other countries to perform special surgery, now with increased bandwidth and communication, the surgeon doesn't need to leave the country of origin. They could perform the surgery by remote control. So there's an example of that particular trade element no longer being necessary. Who wants to have a crack at that? Uh, sure. 
Um, I think I actually see technology as, as a positive uh, for trade. So uh, as Gary mentioned, um, since the global financial crisis, trade has underperformed. It's been really anemic. It's been, uh, it used to storm ahead of global GDP and, and now it does not. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, global, the global economy is also weak. Uh, so what drives growth? We know that three Ps drive growth. Uh, population and participation is probably not likely to help us going forward, given the ageing uh, demographic. Uh, where are we going to see some growth? Maybe productivity, which hasn't helped us um, recently. Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's the answer. And maybe AI and technology um, is, is going to help boost productivity. Um, and, and we think that that's one of the reasons why exporter margins have been squeezed recently. Um, so is, if, if that does translate to higher productivity, Activity, it translates to higher incomes and therefore a, a better outcome for Australia's exporters. I also think it could be interesting going forward uh, to the extent that technology dilutes emerging markets' um, uh, labour cost advantages. So, um, you know, Australia hasn't had a, a, a buoyant um, simply transform manufacturing sector, our laboratory transform manufacturers are starting to do better. Um, but, but, but if, if automi automation erodes uh, labour labor's cost in the overall cost function, then possibly we could see a redistribution, which, which will be interesting to watch. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for that one, Sam. Okay, the next question is from uh, JB. So I'll, I'll ask this one. We don't seem to have a sustainable plan to replace mining, are we overly reliant on hopeful estimates of Chinese demand for our exports uh, in the future? It's sort of a bit of a domestic question. Do you want to have a quick question, <laughs> Sandra? Oh, goodness, sorry. <laughs> um, Look, I think, as I said, um, resource exports expected to be about stable. So, so yes, prices are down, but volume sewn in during the mining boom means that, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, resources will hold up. Port Headland had a record amount of iron ore shipped out of it in May, um, and, and that, that, that goes back into longevity. Um, you know, what is the answer long term? I take your point that, that China is, is very much um, driving the rebalancing towards services and towards high, uh, high, um, high amounts of um, premium agriculture. Um, but I think that it is broader than just China. So in particular, uh, we're seeing export growth in excess of you know, 10% in countries in South Asia, India, um, and Bangladesh in particular. And then in Southeast Asia, you've got a whole host of countries, um, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, all seeing really buoyant uh, export growth. And I think that the statistics and the demographics around that are actually quite compelling. Um, so absolutely, we're expecting a more or diversified export profile, but really, I think that's probably a positive. You know, the gyrations in global commodity prices is, is not good uh, for the stability of one's export profile. If we can uh, be better at, at a more diversified offering, then I think that's probably a positive. Can I pile in on that just briefly? Uh, the big thing is services. Services are the dominant part of the economies of all of us and indeed most of the world, services, services. Now, we've looked at the barriers on services trade, and they are very high. They're higher, and this is by some econometric analysis done, uh, there's a leading French institute on this, SAPI. Uh, they're higher than they are in agriculture, and we usually think of agriculture as being a pretty protected sector, but in services, they are often 50% tariff equivalent up to 100%. So this is the future. This is where trade could really grow in a country like Australia. Uh, you mentioned the education point. You know, that's a service. But there are a lot of other services that can be sold uh, digitally or can be sold by location of uh, firms in the other country and so on, if we can get those barriers down. And that can be a big, big source of export growth. It sort of brings in the point that in looking at um, a, you know, a trading relationship with a particular bilateral partner or, or in the multilateral system on services in particular, we tend to simplistically sometimes just look at barriers being tariff walls, whether they be you know, uh, bound rates or applied rates. You know, we're going to sell 
you know, widgets to X country and, and we're going to pay 10% tariff on it. You get in the services sector, uh, there are a lot of non-tariff trade barriers in terms of regulation if in professional services, recognition, a mutual recognition of qualifications, and so it becomes a bit more of a diverse space uh, in looking at that. And, and Gary's absolutely right. I mean, the you know the growth sector, and it goes to the point earlier about our um, you know our, com our commodities exports to China, for example, or to North Asia, underpinning our our, um, our trade balances. Um, but but the services sector is rapidly growing, and it's often one in negotiations that is. Uh, can be quite sensitive. Um, you know, I remember negotiating with the, the Singaporeans and getting them to recognise legal qualifications from universities across Australia. It took us three or four years to slowly but surely to get Singapore to recognise legal qualifications uh, from different universities in Australia so they could go practice in, in Singapore. But they're the sorts of things get, that can deliver uh, long-term benefits. Um, okay, uh, back, probably back to Gary. Uh, what is the likelihood of the US following through on its promise to impose tariffs on imports? And they've already done a bit, haven't they, on, on steel? Well, I want to be quite precise here. And one of my colleagues, Chad Bone, has the data on our website. Um, we do impose a lot of anti-dumping and countervailing duties, and we have these safeguard cases which are coming up on one on washing machines of all things and another on solar panels and so on. And um, uh, these, as I said, they, can, uh, they prospectively might uh, cover as much as 8% of our imports. Uh, that's up from about 5% prior to Trump. So it's kind of an escalation. But you know, it's not 20% of imports and so forth. The, but the big thing would be if Trump decides to put, you know, a 15% tariff across the board on all Chinese imports. I mean, that would be, well, there, that's how you start a trade war right there. Um, and my guess is that he won't do that because, not because he loves China uh, or loves trade or anything, but because there are plenty of congressmen and business firms which are, <laughs> have seen the danger to their own businesses and their own districts and so on and are pushing back against this. Okay, then the next question. Oh, it's an anonymous one. Mark, this is obviously to me. How if, all, how, if at all, does Host Plus incorporate trade uh, in its investment decisions? Well, I'll get um, to Sam to comment on this in a minute, but from a uh, trustee director's perspective, I mean, in our... Uh, monthly meetings and, and uh, reports from uh, our con as asset consultants. It contains a macro, um, fairly deep dive into uh, global geopolitics and, and economics and what's going on around the world. And so uh, from that, you sort of draw out uh, if the China, if, for example, is going in a particular direction that's going to have a, um, you know, a detrimental effect on the domestic economy there, you know, obviously that's going to have an effect on maybe on your, your emerging market equities portfolio. Uh, it can also have, um, you know, an impact on Australian equities vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, iron ore companies that are exporting to, to China. Um, if you look at uh, some of the, um, the, the, you know, what's going on in the United States at the moment, and that's why this is such a fascinating discussion, uh, because any little move in the US economy by the, the new administration, the Trump administration, has a profound impact and you've got to think how that's going to affect some uh, investment that you might be making on the other side of the world, but it does have an effect. And so th there's, uh, there is a broad uh, coverage, and I know, I know personally, I sort of always think at that macro level, what's going on globally, what's going on in the global economy, how it's going to affect different aspects of, of you know, our asset allocation, um, uh, uh, Portfolio and, and where we're actually investing at the time, and if that should, if that needs rebalancing, uh, Sam, do you want to add a comment to that? Uh, from well, a, from the, the professional CIO's perspective, other than you'd make a great CIO one day, Mark. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any. Now that's spot on. I mean, you need to kind of <clears throat> derive. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, our business is allocated in capital, so you need to place a dollar in market, and the question is. Is there any impediment or any uh, wind behind the particular 
uh, direction that you want to place a dollar in, and the global macro geopolitical effects matter a lot. But uh, they're secondary. Um, you know, there are secondary effects there that you need to take into account. I think that's probably the right answer, Mark. Thanks, Sam. Uh, the next question is an interesting one. Is there a case for global corporate tax rates to promote efficiency of resource allocation rather than distortions derived by political imperatives? That's interesting. I think, Karthik, do you want to have a crack at that? So, sorry, the question is uh, a standardised global rate. Yes, a st standardised, and, and you know, the UK has been in a system where there's been external influences over tax regimes, but yeah, standardised global corporate tax rates, so there's, there's less distortion in, in where investment funds flow. Um, sounds utopian. I think, I don't know how that will work with individual dynamics of regional and particular country economies. Uh, because that's sort of a top-down approach, and then what adjustments would each country need to make to meet that? It's mm. quite challenging, I think, is mm. my, my view. Yeah, yeah well, I, I suppose the only basis for doing something, if you think about uh, the, the work that G20 finance ministers did post the GFC in establishing a whole bunch of agreed universal regulations, if you like, in terms of you know, anti-money laundering laws where there was agreement, uh, across G20 finance ministers. Not, that's not global, that's only G20 finance ministers, but and, and, it'd but have to be through some sort of a forum like that. Yeah. But the OECD as well, for example, we have, and then you can already see that with Ireland, it's slightly different from the rest of the OECD, uh, because then you'll get into that debate of what works purely at an economic level versus the political level, mm. if the underlying beneficiaries of the people are not uh, catered for. Yeah. by that change at a global level. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I check in on that one? I, uh, I, I was uh, the Treasury's person on international taxation for many years back in the <coughs> 70s. Um, and so I want to take these 30 seconds to rebut some of the things that Stephen told you in the last session. First of all, we're not going to have any uniform national international tax rate. Secondly, it would be very bad if, if we had this because one of the best things that happened in the international economy since the 1980s has been this competition between countries to get the corporate tax rates down. And why do I say that? Because corporate taxes are the most distortionary and the worst kind of tax of all. Maybe all taxes you can say are bad. They all have some distortionary impact. But corporate taxes, the econometrics is unassailable. They are very very harmful uh, to, uh, uh, to economic productivity. And the U.S. has harmed itself far more by taxation than kind of any other uh, bad policies we've had, though we're having, you know, trade will be a, is a competitor for our bad tax policy. So um, I'm, I'm really against these uh, notions that we should harmonize or that we should go for this OECD program of base erosion and profit shifting uh, recommendations. That's my 30 seconds. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Gary. Okay, we've got uh, a question for, for Karthik. Michael McQueen, do you want to ask your question? Put your hand up so they can give you a mic. This one's for you, Karthik. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how you balance the immediate and unexpected need to negotiate with the EU um, with you know, like the opportunity cost of negotiating with Asia, which is going to be the, the growth driver for sort of the next 100 years? Um, so from a pure uh, legal protocol point of view, uh, until the exit happens, we're not allowed to enter into formal negotiations. Um, so at this stage, quite honestly, the balancing act is how do we prep up for it, uh, how we have the conversations uh, on a bilateral basis. But the actual clock will only start when we are formally out of the EU. So. To answer your question, there is a balancing act for this for this stage at least. It's very cut and dry that until that stage we can't enter into anything formally. Um, but in terms of uh, laying the pathways for future, as you said, for the next hundred years, the conversations are underway in terms of where potentially we could have uh, those kind of relationships, and that's happening already. Um, and we've had you know feedback from countries, including Australia, where uh, there's been positive overtures. Uh, but purely in terms of going by the book, uh, we can't enter into anything or sign or have formal discussions. 
Th thanks, Cathy. That actually leads into another question that we've got here that refers to the UK and Asia from uh, uh, Alan Parapuram. Alan? Yep, over here. Got a mic, girls, please. Question for the panel. Is there an opportunity for Australia to be a, 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 a proxy or a staging post for the US and the UK um, to Asia, given the proximity to Asia? No. <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Gary. Well, Australia gets a lot of, it's well listened to in Washington. Um, and I remember when Mark was uh, in charge of this, he, I think he had pretty good relations with the U.S. government at that time. So if, if you wanted to talk about an honest broker between the U.S. and China, for example, you couldn't really do better than, than Australia. And I know that President Trump talked with Turnbull just the other day and had some conversation along these lines. So I think there's a, there's a small amount of room for that, yes. Um, not, if, if I can just add, you know, given my background, not necessarily as a proxy um, because often Australia will go into an environment for, in a bilateral discussion and get asked that question, are you here as a proxy for the United States? And the answer is always clearly no. You know, we're a sovereign nation, we make our own decisions. But certainly as, a, as a, an honest broker that, that our third parties don't seem threatened by, absolutely. I mean, Australia played a key role in, in um, working with China initially to get um, PNTR, which is um, Permanent normal trade. normal trade Relations, established with the US, which was a precursor for China entering the WTO. And, and so given Australia's unique relationship with China, we're certainly able to do that. And, and obviously, um, as, as you know, the UK starts to roll out their own trade policy and build bilateral relationships, um, it'll certainly be in, in Australia's interest to work closely with the UK the way we have um, with, with the United States. And, you know, there are often, um, we, we do things often that Washington does not agree with. I, I remember when um, we were beginning our, our discussions with the Chinese to launch um, the uh, Australia-China Free Trade Agreement negotiations in 2005, you know, we, we exercised um, a fair amount of pragmatism in recognised China as a market economy. You know, we probably needed to put socialist in front of the word market. Um, but uh, we did because, you know, we took the view that China at that stage needed to be sort of drawn in to the international trading system more. Um, and what better way to do it than to start doing bilateral deals? And I remember you know, getting a lecture from Bob Zellick at the oh, time. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's quite capable of doing those things. But, but again, sometimes we, we do things in Australia that uh, our major partner, trading partners like the US don't agree with. But certainly as a, an honest broker in that relationship, I think Australia has, uh, you're right, Australia has a, uh, a role to play. Can I add, and, add to that? Yeah, I think, Karthik. Uh, I don't know if there's a blanket answer to that. I think that it's probably country-wise as well. Um, so the UK has... Uh, direct partnership on certain things with China, Brazil, and India, for example. But I would say that some, somewhere in Southeast Asia, there'll be countries where that partnership or tripartite approach would work, uh, and also in certain sectors, I think, as well. Um, I think professional services is one, uh, because of the uh, proximity and the familiarity of the type of uh, governance culture and professional services culture and affinity. So there, I agree, there'll be an uh, approach. The other one is what we're doing a lot now with China and uh, also LATAM is on the sustainable investments, so helping them with their uh, greening the economy post Paris climate change. Uh, how we can do that in this side of the world. So we're doing a lot in China directly, and, and I think in, in a way they, they prefer that. They want to go direct to us. So much so that even with the Hong Kong, they would want us to do through China first. They don't want it to go through different routes. Um, but there'll be areas in Southeast Asia, I think, where that would that actually work. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we better keep moving through these questions. We've got six minutes to go. There's one uh, to Cassandra. In your opinion, what does protectionism and the level thereof mean for global trade and the Australian export market? Uh, well, um, 
Look, protectionism has been on the rise and I, I think we see that as a key challenge and headwind as I saw earlier, as I said earlier. Uh, so the Productivity Commission has recently done a really interesting report on this. Um, they modelled a scenario in which uh, all countries around the world, including Australia, increase their tariffs by 15 percentage points. So sort of a global trade war akin to what we saw in the 1930s. Uh, and the results were, that were, were really clear and they were damning. So um, in in that situation, world trade was expected to fall by about 22%. Um, the global economy in recession in Australia absolutely wouldn't um, sort of escape that, that situation unscathed. Um, I think Australia's GDP fell by 1% and a large percentage of Australia's uh, capital stock that was built up during the mining investment phase uh, was mothballed. Um, so I think that the rising trend in protectionism is, is really worrying and to the extent to which it, it, it resulted in sort of a, a cataclysmic uh, protectionist situation, that would be um, unduly bad. And I suppose just on that point, and, and um, um, you know, I've had the opportunity in Washington post the election of the Trump administration, and, and in a meeting with Wilbur Ross, asked a similar question. Uh, you'd all be aware that they've been systematically reviewing a lot of the bilateral arrangements off the back of the comments about NAFTA and the arrangements with Canada and um, and Mexico. And I asked the question: you know, is, is the, the Trump administration likely to be reviewing? the Australia-US free trade agreement, and if so, what elements of it? And the response I got when I asked that question was a fairly positive one, that they thought that it was a pretty a reasonable deal and they didn't see any, uh, any unsavoury aspects to it, and, and which, was, which was a great relief. But, but, it's, but it is interesting, and, and so much of the focus in coming years is going to be on, on that aspect, because, I mean, you know, a, a lot of countries, for example, uh, that, that are... Uh, you yeah, know, drag their feet on trade liberalisation, if you like, and some for very good reason. Uh, developing countries have sort of taken a bit more heart in not engaging as quickly and as deeply because of the, the position the United States uh, has taken at the moment. I, there was a question here that I thought, oh yeah, a question to Gary. Um, can you envisage the US dollar losing its reserve currency status? Um, and, and if so, how quickly could that unravel? Uh, not very quickly. Um, uh, my colleague Arvind Subramanian, who's now a chief economist in India, uh, <clears throat> he did a book on this uh, several years back, and he he sort of thought that maybe the RMB would come up quite quickly as an alternative reserve currency. Uh, most of us in the institute were skeptical, and I remain pretty skeptical about about that for the reasons of the depth of the market, the liquidity of uh, the Treasury bills and, and so forth and so on, that it's just, it's just been very a very slow process. Even the euro has had only a very small and slow uh, growth as an increment, as a reserve currency, a transaction currency, and so forth. And it, of course, is backed uh, very strongly by a number of European countries. So, so I'm, uh, I, I'm skeptical on that. But if I could just add one more point on the dollar, as you know, Trump is totally fixated on trade deficits, wrongly, but totally. And uh, he thinks the trade agreements are the way to, uh, to reduce U.S. trade deficits, which is completely non complete nonsense. It will not work. But what is happening is that the dollar is going down because the U.S. economy is, is softening. Uh, and uh, the dollar has dropped substantially, about 10 percent against the euro within the last uh, eight months or so, and that does make a difference in trade deficit. So maybe if the dollar continues to weaken further, <laughs> you know, maybe he'll get some relief on his trade deficit fixation, not for the reasons he, he's, he's seeking, but because of this alternative macro force, which is quite powerful. The, no, that, that's a positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a positive. That is a positive. You know, for, a, for an exporting nation that uh, all of our international trade is denominated in U.S. dollars, um, you know, a, uh, uh, it's, it's, it has an effect. It does have an effect. Um, but it, it, on the flip side, uh, it might have an effect on the thinking uh, in, inside the administration yeah. if it helps them become a bit more uh, competitive. But, I mean, if you look at the movement um, in, in the Aussie-U.S., 
uh, FX in the last 12 months, we've sort of gone from probably down around about 73 up to almost 80 cents. And, and for, for companies that export in, in US dollar denomination, it can have a profound impact on, on revenue flows. Now, there was, um, oh my goodness, we'll get this one out of the way and then we'll have a last one. Would a Trump impeachment be a real positive for world trade? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody on the panel? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, yeah, I, I think the impeachment scenario is a, it's a fantasy that the Democrats enjoy talking about. It's not going to happen. Uh, but would it be good for uh, world trade? Well, Pence, you know, the Vice President Pence, he was very much for TPP until he became mm. the candidate. So his thinking, it's much more sensible. In Indiana, a very heartland state, has done quite well, quite well in the international economy. So maybe after the <laughs> dust settled, you know, you might have a different, uh, a different world, but uh, chances are small. <laughs> Very interesting, Gary, that you raise Mike Pence, and, and occasionally you see the Vice President um, speaking on behalf of the administration. And earlier this year, he actually visited Australia. And I think that for, for um, you know, people that, that watch U.S. politics and, and, you know, the impact of what's going on in the U.S. across the world uh, take a bit of heart in, in you know, the, the calibre right. uh, of Mike Pence. And there are some, some funds in this room that actually own a piece of the Indiana toll road that oh. he, he sold to, uh, to IFM, yeah, yeah. And so um, the, I think that, that in amongst the whole group of people in, in the administration running the United States, there, there are some sound thinkers, you're right. Okay, we just we are just about out of time, but there's one last question that I saw come up that we'll we'll go. What would be the single most important action stroke issue that would need to be completed addressed to restart the growth in world trade? <laughs> While they're thinking, I can answer it in one word. I, I, I Leadership. Said it. You said at the start, they, Gary, leadership. Uh, unilateral free trade by the UK. <laughs> <laughs> back to Ricardo, back to Adam Smith. Uh, I, I think reduction of barriers, uh, yeah. but I agree that leadership and um, I think there's need for a charismatic leader to sort of revolutionise that. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, we've got a little bit more. Oh, no, it's running into this, running back up the clock. We've just run out of time, everybody. <laughs> thank you very much for your participation. If I can uh, thank the... Um, the panellists very, very much for making the effort to be here and participate in this discussion. It is going to be an ongoing and fascinating discussion. We're back here in 12 months. The whole structure and, and the, the atmosphere in this space is going to be different again. Um, and it'll be a, a new question, but one that should be at the top of minds of pe people making um, investment decisions. So thank you.